Republicans are hoping to regain control of the Minnesota House in 2021. In my conversation with House Minority Leader Kurt Doubt, I began by asking him how his caucus's approach would differ from that of House Democrats in working with Governor Walls to address the COVID-19 pandemic and the significant budget shortfall. I, you know, think it's very important that we have a divided government in Minnesota, and I think that uh, Minnesotans have become used to that. So we're going to have a, a, a Democrat governor for the next two years and Governor Walls. Um, and we feel very optimistic about our opportunity to take the majority back in the Minnesota House. Um, as far as working with the governor, I've been very disappointed that Democrats really haven't stepped up uh, and, and become and, and fulfilled the co-equal branch of government that we are uh, during this pandemic. It's a very important time that um, a lot of Minnesotans really care deeply about. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't had that legislative involvement. We haven't had legislative hearings where people can participate even, even virtually um, and give their, their input. And it's very difficult for citizens to reach out and, and contact the governor's office. So um, we think having a, a legislature that's working right alongside the governor and with the governor is very, very important. So um, that's exactly what we intend to do uh, if we're elected to the majority. You have extensive experience addressing budget shortfalls. What concerns you most about the shortfall that's going to face uh, lawmakers in 2021, especially with the knowledge that Minnesota Federal Reserve President Neil Kashkari says it may take some time to rebuild the economy? Well, I have been uh, the only one kind of sounding the alarm as to how bad things actually are right now uh, for our budget. Uh, we have seen about a $9 billion uh, turn to the negative just in the last six months. Um, and that's uh, projected to continue into the next biennium. We currently have a two and a half billion dollar deficit in the, in the current biennium. Um, that our, our governor's current plan is to spend the reserves down to zero. Um, and then in the tails we have, uh, uh, in the, which we call the next biennium, we call the tails. Um, we have a deficit currently projected at 4.7 billion. Um, there were some shifts that were projected to happen in the tails, which won't be able to happen now that the reserves will be zero. Um, so that will take the deficit up to 5.3 billion. Um, and, and that's very, very difficult and challenging when we have made no corrective action during the current biennium. Um, that could make our job easier in the tails. So I have been sounding the alarm fairly loudly and, and I think we need to take action as, as soon as we can um, to find the efficiencies in government that we need to uh, to make sure that we're able to, to handle this budget deficit. In addition to uh, budget shortfalls, the state has tools that, that can aid businesses uh, to get that economy jump-started again once it is, you know, we're able to do so. What would your caucus do to help those businesses get going? Well, we specifically uh, gave businesses um, a lot of uh, flexibility. We gave counties and cities a lot of flexibility to help businesses in the COVID CARES Act money that came from the federal government that we then passed on to local units of government. Our hope is that many of those local units of government have helped out uh, with grants um, and loans, helped out businesses in their communities. So. Um, that was our intent uh, with that language, and, and we're going to hope that that's successful, although we won't know probably until the end of the year. We also want to promote job growth um, on, on projects that we know are, are ready. Uh, mainly that's uh, line three in northern Minnesota. It's replacement of an oil pipeline um, that was originally recommended to be replaced by the Obama administration. Uh, that particular project is $3 billion of private investment and would create uh, thousands of jobs, uh, thousands of good paying union jobs uh, in northern Minnesota. Unfortunately, Democrats have been against that replacement um, and have been trying to stop it at all cost. Um, and the problem is they're, they're really only stopping that, uh, that economic boost to our economy. And, and frankly, uh, you know, we think that the local units of government could use that property tax revenue, and we think Minnesotans could use those jobs. Minnesota already suffers one of the worst achievement gaps in education in the nation, and experts fear that the pandemic is only exacerbating those disparities. As the state begins to rebuild when, the, when COVID, there's a vaccine and, and, and life begins to go back to as we knew it, um, what will your party do to help begin erasing those disparities? In education. Well, okay. I think we also can't wait until uh, the pandemic is over to worry about the kids who are most affected by the achievement gap. 
Um, there are some shocking statistics. In Minnesota, if you are a minority student or a low-income student in the Minneapolis school district, you have less than a 50% chance of graduating from high school. And, and what worries me is, uh, according to the governor's plan of, of whether we'll have in-person classes or uh, folks will, will participate in distance learning, um, this, the cities uh, that have the highest achievement gaps will, will very likely be the ones that will not have in-person classes, uh, which ultimately means the governor's plan is going to disaffect um, those students uh, in, a, in a much greater way who are already so greatly impacted by the achievement gap and, and probably leave them further behind. Um, I would recommend taking action immediately to put at least those, those high risk, uh, low income and minority students that are most at high risk uh, for the achievement gap, um, put them into in-person classes um, and have the other students at home or work out some sort of a hybrid where they can get the tools that they need to be successful. Um, beyond that, I think we need to to exercise school choice um, and give parents of, of low income uh, parents and, and minority uh, student parents the ability to put their kids into the best education situation that works for them. Um, you know, I've kind of coined the term recently that private schools shouldn't just be for rich kids. Um, they should be for any kid who needs that uh, learning environment. And if the public school isn't working for them, um, we need to get them in a situation that is working. And unfortunately, right now, um, with a graduation rate of less than 50% for the highest risk kids, um, that education system in our public schools is not working and we cannot ignore it. Republicans in the House have been clear that Governor Walls should cease his emergency powers and allow people and businesses to deal with COVID-19 as they see fit. Um, President Trump, people close to him, lawmakers in the nation's capital, have since come down with COVID-19 following an event in the Rose Garden where there wasn't social distancing or mask wearing. How do you balance public health and personal responsibility? Well, I think first of all, COVID is a very serious issue. Um, it's incredibly deadly for folks that are in a, a high risk category. If you're, you're uh, advancing in age uh, in a nursing home, if you have underlying conditions, um, we know that it's as severe or even more severe than originally projected. What we have found out in the last six months is that it's not as severe uh, for the rest of us. And, and so we have to figure out how to balance um, a, a, a a pandemic that has been here for six months and, and has no signs of leaving immediately. So um, we can't shut down our economy indefinitely until this is, uh, uh, you know, back to normal or, or cured. Uh, what we need to do is, is figure out how to live with COVID-19. And what that means is protecting the most vulnerable, making sure that, uh, that we're doing exactly the opposite of what uh, Governor Walls originally did, which was transfer people into nursing homes. Um, and, and secondly, we need to uh, you know, let other people go about their normal lives uh, while still respecting social distancing and wearing masks. Finally, uh, on a personal note, uh, how, did, how did you feel after you heard about President Trump's positive COVID-19 diagnosis? Having met him on the tarmac as he swung through Minnesota, were you panicked? Were you scared? Um, how's your health? How's it going? Well, uh, thank you for the question. I, you know, it's obviously interesting, uh, always fun and always an honor to meet a president, regardless of what your politics are. I was invited to meet the president on the tarmac in Minneapolis. Um, I did that. We were with him for about five minutes, uh, socially distanced. Um, I then did step next to him just for a brief period of time and take a picture. Uh, obviously, I posted that picture on social media because I thought it was a cool picture. Um, 24 hours later, I woke up in a world where the, the president of the United States had uh, a po tested positive for COVID and I was one of the people that he had exposed um, and maybe one of the very few people that he had exposed and, and probably one of the only people to get that close to him and post a photo of it um, in the recent days uh, prior. So um, I did go into uh, uh, quarantine and, and um, I've sought uh, one uh, COVID test for which I tested negative. I will seek at least one more and maybe two more um, just to make sure that we're, we're sa absolutely safe. So um, taking every precaution, but um, also uh, understand that my situation and interaction with the president was very low risk. It was outside. It was for less than uh, 30 seconds, really. Um, and, and I don't think that meets the CDC guidelines of a close interaction so or close contact. So um, I'm taking uh, precautions probably beyond what the CDC would require. Minority Leader Kurt Doubt, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. 
Thank you so much.